project the gospel? As we study the gospel today, I want you to be observant and try to derive uh, three principles uh, from the gospel. And specifically, I want you to keep in mind that Jesus Christ has come to fully reveal who God is. So if we study how Jesus Christ acted in this particular gospel, it will also give us an uh, opportunity to, to really understand who God really is. So try to figure out, okay, what are some of the things that, based on the gospel today, that we can begin to say, okay, that's how God is. That's how he acts. That, because Jesus Christ came to reveal uh, the Father to us. But at the same time, as you're trying to derive that, that also has an implication for each one of us. Because if we call ourselves Christians, and indeed we are, we follow the way of Christ, and if this is what Christ did, then that's also something we must do as followers of Christ. So in seeing this gospel, we begin to see about in regards to who God is and two, how we should also be as sons and daughters of the same God, the same Father. So let's just, let's just go from the beginning. Uh, so he goes to the district of uh, Tyre. He went to the city. Of, now here important is he went into the Decapolis. Uh, so Jesus is a Jew. He was sent to the house of Israel to save the house of Israel. But here he's going beyond. The Capolis, which is actually a Greek word, it's, it's one of the cities where most of the majority of people who lived there were Greek. So this is Jesus going beyond just the house of Israel. We begin to see the call for a universal uh, mission. So in relationship with God, God is concerned with all people, not just the Israelites, but all people. Now, in regards to us, well, we have to be concerned with all people, not just those in my own household. So a call for universality. Therefore, Catholic Church, a universal church. So let's keep going to the next one. Um, and people brought to him a deaf man who had a speech impediment and begged him to lay hands on him. Once again, the importance of intercession. It was, some, it, it was a group of people. I, we don't know how many or who but they were the one who brought this person to Jesus. So it highlights the importance of our intercessory prayer. We, we have the power to pray on behalf of someone and have an effect. So, but careful when you ask for something not to be too specific of how that's going to be fulfilled. So they want this man to be healed from his speech impediment and from uh, his hearing difficulties. Uh, but they say, uh, and lay hands on him. Well, what if he doesn't want to lay hands? He has another way that he wants to heal. And in the entire gospel, as you follow, he never lay hands on him. So we intercede, Lord, we, we pray for this, for that person, for this situation. But how will it be resolved? Well, let God take care of that part. He will know better. We might have our own expectations of how uh, our prayers can be answered, but... He knows what's best. If it's laying the hands, if it's everything else that follow, and we will read it, just leave that to the Lord. You intercede. You pray, and then let God be God. Do not put conditions of how God is going to do it. Let him do it, okay? Next one. Um, now, here's when it gets interesting. I, I want you to keep in mind, this reveals something about who God is. This reveals about who we should be in relation with others. So, he put his finger into the man's ear. Oh, no, no, hold on. Let's go back. We skip a big one here. All right. Let's begin with that one. Okay, so lay hand on him. He took him off by himself away from the crowd. That sentence is loaded with a lot of significance. One, the mere fact that Jesus will put the finger, can, can I? No, you're just supposed to say, no, I ain't going to do that. <laughs> Putting your finger on someone's ear. Now, if it's grandma, mommy, daddy with the children, okay, I, I can see that, you know, the clean boogers and the, all that nasty stuff. Uh, but just to put your finger on someone's ear, uh, raise your hand yeah. with your finger, and now put it in the ear of the person. No, no, don't do that. <laughs> Some of you did. <laughs> 
You actually were waiting for me to say that. Uh -huh. <laughs> so <laughs> you're paying attention. That's good. <laughs> uh, that's weird. Uh, that is a practice at the time. We could go into the historical critical analysis of uh, it, it's, it's a customary thing in the time of Jesus. Uh, okay, that's, that's fine, but, but that's weird. Putting your finger in someone's ear. And if that's not enough, he goes even further. Then he spits and touches his tongue. <laughs> you ready to do that one? <laughs> Uh, we don't have a maintenance person in our church, so we're not going to be spitting around here, please. Uh, <laughs> we, we only clean by volunteer basis, so I don't know. Unless you want to use your saliva to mop the entire church, go for it. No, it's disgusting. <laughs> it's messy. But what does it say about God? He doesn't care putting his finger into your ear or into whatever part in you is closed up. Whatever parts in you need healing, he's not afraid to put his healing hands upon it. He's not afraid to get messy, spitting, uh, touching tongue, full of saliva. Ugh, now with COVID, we all become, uh, what's the word for those who are bacteria phobia, COVID phobia. We're, uh, six feet distance, don't even give me the sign of peace, uh, just stay away from me to touch your tongue. But that says something about our God. He's not afraid to be in us, in the parts of us that need healing, and he's not worried about getting messy to the point that God becomes man, one of us. In all things but sin, he entered the messiness of our human complexity and is messy. And not only that, but fast forward, he gave us the Eucharist. That's his desire to be in us. His own body, blood, soul, and divinity. Blood is messy, and that's what he wants to give us. And that's what he wants in us. Whew, that's, that's a lot about God. This is revealing who God is. But it also reveals how we ought to relate with others. Not to be afraid to go into those places that often are clothed up and to go there and to get our hands messy in service, in sacrificial giving, in love, because that's what we have received from God. And what we receive of a God that doesn't care about getting messy in our lives to enter the places where we are ashamed and closed up and he's able to come in and to heal and to make you whole, it is in that same love that we become instruments to others. For us to be the finger of God that enters into places in people's life where they're hurting, where there's pain, where it's messy, where it's dirty. So it reveals something about God, but it also reveals of what we ought to be doing in Christ Jesus. Not just physically messy, but then this part here, he looked up to heaven and groaned. When I looked at the word groan in the dictionary, it was described and defined as a deep, sound that is prolonged and expressive of pain. Coming from a deep and expressed with a deep sound, but coming from pain. Question here. What pain did Jesus Christ have? at that moment. But feeling the suffering of this person. So it's almost like by putting, you got long hair, they won't see that I actually <laughs> did, you know. <laughs> and it's almost
almost like what he's physically doing is connecting with you individually. He takes us apart from the crowd by ourselves. This is intimate. This is personal. And he wants to connect so that your pain becomes his pain. And from feeling your pain, he groans to the Father. Not only asking that it be open, but asking that it be open. And the flood just pour down in mercy and love. So it's an openness that is not just directed to the one being healed, but to the source of all healing. Because it says, and said to him, who is the him? We automatically think that he's talking about the deaf man. But in the context of the line, it says he looked up to heaven and said to him, could that him also be the father? So then we now see Jesus Christ as the mediator connecting to the human suffering of an individual and connecting to God the Father. And he's right in the middle as fully human and fully divine. And in his groaning for feeling the pain of an individual, he groans to the Father and open wide the gateway for healing. And notice, we go back to what were the people asking? Lay hands on him, and that's it. Did he lay hands on him? No laying of the hand. A connection. A feeling it with and opening the gateways of heaven. So that this person, more than just healing, can experience a wholeness. He could have said, be healed. And he didn't say that. He said, be opened. Whoa, 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 hold on. That puts a spin into healing. That somehow healing comes as we are opened. And if you're not open, healing won't happen. And Jesus was concerned more than the physical dimensions He's concerned from the, for the ultimate good, salvation for this person. And for this person to be healed and whole and saved, be open to the person and to the gates of heaven. Be open. Often we, we pray for a specific need or cause or a person with very specific conditions, do this, do that. Let's trust that God knows what is best. And what God desires is more than what you're asking for. Because he's concerned for the bigger picture, not just here, but eternal life. And if that's so of God, what is it of us? We too must connect with each other, be open to feel the pain of my brother and sister. By definition, that's the word compassion, to feel with the other. But more than compassion, what Jesus is showing there is mercy, because by definition, the word mercy is not just to feel the pain of another, but we move into action, to solve, to alleviate the pain. And more than a healing, openness to life eternal, that should be us. Each one of us concerned for our individual brothers and sisters, not to tr treat them as a, as a mass of people. Oh, I, I'm good for and peace to all. No, Jesus took a part individually, personally, away from the crowd, developed a, a, a personal, intimate encounter, connected with the person in those places where the person was closed up, and how often we are closed up out of fear. We're protecting ourselves. We've been hurt long enough. We, we turn into survival mode and close ourselves up. There Jesus is saying, open up. We look at our history, our mistakes. We are ashamed. 
We're afraid if people find out what I did. And we closed ourselves. There Jesus wants to get messy. Enter there, but open up. He's not going to force himself. And notice all along is the intercession of someone else who brought the openness on this person. And we have that power to intercede for one another that we may be open to each other and ultimately open to the God who is already open and waiting to just flow in mercy and love upon each one of us. And how, that, how was that accomplished? Well, when Jesus Christ opened wide his arms on the cross, he opened the gates of heaven. So the flood is there. It's, it's ready to be received, but often we're so close, close up to ourselves. So what does it say of God? What does it say of us? And what does it say about us relating to others? Now, I ask you at the beginning, okay, let's try to derive at least three principles that, that show us who God is and how we should relate with others. I, I will summarize it in three ways. Uh, hopefully you will agree. I don't know. It, it, could, it could be other three points. But for now, I'm going to focus on these three things. One, notice how God treats each individual with dignity with respect, with love, treating the individual as a unique, unrepeatable gift in which he is worried, concerned, delight, and wants what's best. But he treats each one personally. So to us, we must treat each other in dignity, each individual, regardless of language, of race, of culture, of gender, of economic, economical status, of religion, of nationality, of sexual orientation. We got to treat everyone with dignity. Why? Because everyone is a child of God. And to offend a child of God would be to offend God himself and to offend yourself. Because like it or not, that is your brother that is your sister. Might not be as you want it, but it is who it is, your brother, your sister. So one principle in relationship with God, who God is and how we should act, is to treat each other with dignity. Notice this little detail. Why did Jesus took him apart? Not just for that intimate encounter, but he already knew what he was going to do. He knew he was going to heal him. And if he were to hear, if he's in the middle of a crowd, he may be sensory overwhelmed with all the noises and sounds he's hearing for the first time. Look how sensitive he is, thinking ahead of the game and saying, let me put him apart so that when he's able to hear, he's not overwhelmed. Look how concerned for the well-being Jesus is. Therefore, God is. Therefore, we should be. The second point that I think is important is, is the element of connecting. Putting my finger in someone's ear and my, my, other, my other finger after spitting, put it in someone's tongue. I'm not literally suggesting we do that. You might have to do that in some occasions. Who knows? And if that happens, may that be a trigger to remember this homily and remember the call to treat each person with dignity. Uh, but symbolically means we need to connect. We need to feel compassion, feel with the other. And more than that, mercy. You feel it, you've grown within, and you want to make a difference. You want to solve it. You want to change. You want action because that's what mercy does. You feel it in your core, misere, core, dar, in Spanish, mercy. That's what it means. Misery that you feel in the heart and you're moving to action. By definition, that's the word mercy. So when we connect when we are open to each other and we connect, you will feel and it will hurt and you will groan. Let your groaning be your intercessory prayer. Let that groaning be what inspires you to make a difference, to help, to alleviate, to heal, and more than healing, to seek wholeness. So if the first one is the human dignity, the second one with this sense of compassion, of 
mercy, of solidarity with one another. But the third one, to seek the good beyond this earth. People were asking, lay hands, heal him. But Jesus went beyond that. And instead of calling out for healing, he called out for openness. That leads to healing, that leads to wholeness, that leads to salvation, that leads to eternal life. So the third principle is God is concerned for our ultimate good. And not just a common good, but the ultimate of all common good, eternal life. This life will pass. Some of you might not even make it to this week. And that puts things in perspective. If I go this week, can I say that I lived a life like Christ Jesus did, treating each other with dignity, feeling at the core of my heart and being moved into action, into healing, into wholesomeness, into salvation? And can I rest in peace knowing that the ultimate good will be granted to me but we know it well. Jesus already warned us. Who will receive of the ultimate good? Those who fed the hungry, who gave something to drink to the thirsty, who visited the ones who were sick and in prison, the one who took care of those who were naked and were strangers. Because when we do so for the little ones and for those in need among us, we're doing it to Christ. And if we're doing it to Christ, we're doing it to God. So this is the time to see in the other God himself. This is the time to connect and feel with the pain of the other because that's feeling the pain with Christ Jesus and groaning with him. And to be concerned for salvation, the ultimate good of all, because that is the mission. That is the reason why Christ died and the reason why we are Christians. May today's gospel and the words of G Jesus echo in our hearts. Ephetha. And may it be opened up in us.